Howdy folks, welcome to God in Genesis study for uh, the weekend of July the 5th. My name is Sam Troyer and I will be your study leader today. The title to today's study is Lessons in Life and Love. It's about the time when Jacob got his comeuppance. He who tricked his brother for the birthright and his father for the blessing received payback when he woke up on the first morning of his honeymoon with the older sister of his beloved Rachel in his bed. Jacob had gotten what he wanted in life so far. God has a lot of work to do on Jacob to make him into the clan leader that he should be. In our story today, he ran head on into an even greater trickster than he was in his uncle Laban. This is lesson number 42 in the series from the book of Genesis. Today's study passage is Genesis chapter 29. You can find these class videos on speakthegoodword.com on the God in Genesis page. You can also find them on my YouTube channel by searching Samuel Troyer. Do you ever feel that if anyone found out the truth about you, you'd be finished? Do you go through life basically trying to convince others that you are something you're not? That you're cool when you know you're not? That you're confident or skillful or good-hearted when you know it's not so? John Corcoran knows what that's like. During grade school, he never learned to read or write, but he caused a lot of trouble and somehow kept getting promoted to the next grade. He got to high school and mastered new skills. He says, I started cheating by turning in other people's papers, dated the valedictorian, and ran around with college prep kids. I couldn't read words, but I could read the system, and I could read people. He received an athletic scholarship to Texas Western College and cheated his way through there as well, getting a degree in education of all things. Somehow he got a job as a teacher and for the next 17 years taught in high school without being able to read or write. He says what I did was I created an oral and visual environment. There wasn't the written word in there. I always had two or three teacher's assistants in each class to do board work or read the bulletin. Finally, he left teaching and became a real estate developer. Later in life, he learned to read and write and became an advocate for better education systems. In a sense, we're all like John Corcoran. Most of us don't have to fake reading and writing, but we live our lives trying to persuade ourselves, persuade other people, and persuade God himself that we are good people. Deep down inside, though, we have a growing awareness it's not true. God is gracious in continuing to work in us what we need to make us who we should be. In our introduction, I have, uh, would like to make a few points. The first one is that we left Jacob at Bethel. Our last lesson in the God in Genesis series, we left Jacob at Bethel. He had spent the night under the stars dreaming. He had left his mom and dad back in there tents at Beersheba. He left behind a very angry brother. He was running from him, running for his life. He was also on a mission to go find a wife in Haran with his mother's kin. He left without anyone and without his inheritance. He had just had a vision, a ladder reaching down from heaven. Angels were walking up and down the ladder and God was standing at the top. The vision made an impression on Jacob. God promised to go with Jacob and to multiply his seed. Today, he arrives at his destination and finds his kinsfolk. He finds the love of his life and more, more loves than he was expecting. He ends up with four wives and more than enough trouble to go around. Scripture does not only record the flattering accounts of the patriarchs. It tells it just the way it is. Scripture does not condone what happens here in the case of Jacob. It merely relates the account. It records the history. And we can learn lessons from the account. All scripture is given for our learning and is profitable for teaching. Today's story 
is a weird one. If it occurred today, it would probably be filmed and find itself on Oprah or Jerry Springer or one of the other weird daytime reality shows or soaps. The story today has almost all the elements of a novel. There is romance, there is heartbreak, there is hurt, there is jealousy, there is deceit and trickery to beat all, there is love, there is faith, there is poor judgment, there is folklore and superstition. There is bigamy. There is poetic justice here. And above all, there is the hand of God still working in the life of the patriarch Jacob, through whom would come the earthly line of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Begin with the cast of characters in today's story. First, there is Jacob. Jacob is in his 70s. This may surprise you. Jacob is in his 70s, which would translate today to a man in his 30s and 40s. An older single man who is looking for a wife. And God will provide, and then some. He has learned some things. He has had contact with God through a dream. He still has many rough edges. He's still a schemer. He still will do almost anything to get what he wants. He is a hustler. Grass does not grow under this man's feet. He is intense. He has not really learned to depend on God yet. His faith is not yet the faith of Abraham. The second of the characters is Laban. He is Jacob's uncle. He is his mom's brother. He's a very greedy man, a despot, and an absolute tyrant in his own little kingdom. He's a crafty old man a deceiver with ambitions, a man who tried to get the best of everyone around him. And he's a real match for Jacob, and maybe just what Jacob needed. Then there's Rachel, the beautiful Rachel, a beautiful young lady, probably a bit older than most single ladies of that time. Don't know why, except maybe nobody would dare to come to Laban's house to ask for her hand in marriage. She was outgoing. Rachel was. She was strong. She was vivacious, very attractive to her cousin Jacob. And there's Leah, older than Rachel, Rachel's older sister. She had weak eyes, the Bible says. Don't know what that means. Maybe she was just shy. This term was never used in a derogatory manner in Scripture. Her eyes maybe had less sparkle than those of Rachel. She was more reserved than her younger sister, possibly more godly. At least she seemed to pray to God more often in the biblical account that we read. To round out the cast of character, there is Laban's wife and sons. They're in the background in this story, and they are they're extras, if you will. The study passage, as I mentioned earlier, is Genesis chapter 29. We're going to read the first 30 verses. And uh, I'll read those now. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large. And when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Naor? They said, We know him. He said to them, Is it well with him? They said, It is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go, pasture them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. 
Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. And as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went in to her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? That's as far as we'll read from our text today. We'll begin with the story. Jacob arrives at a well close to Haran and finds a bunch of presumably young shepherds with their flocks gathered around the well that had a large stone on top. It may have been a privately owned well with restrictions as to its use. They were waiting till enough of them came so they could put their shoulders together and get the stone off the top of the well or until the time the owner permitted the use of the well. Probably goofing off a bit too. Where are you from? He asked the boys. We're from Haran, they replied. They, also, they still spoke the same language Aramaic and could communicate with, with Jacob. He said, do you know this guy Laban? Sure, we know him, they said. We know him too well, I bet. There comes his daughter now. She takes care of sheep too. The dude has so many animals, his daughters are pressed into service. Jacob sees the young lady coming and decides to make a good first impression. He runs over and huffs and puffs and rolls the stone away all by himself. Hoorah! What a he-man! He draws water for the sheep. He walks on over and gives the young lady a kiss. Come on, you want a little strong for first sight, don't you think? A stranger that looks a bit the worse for travel wear and probably hasn't brushed his teeth in a couple of weeks at least. First mention in scripture of kissing cousins. What is he doing now? He's crying. Then he tells her who he is. Actions seem to show that he didn't give a hoot for convention. Water the flock, kiss the lady, tell her who he is. The young lady runs off to tell dad. Boy, does she have something to share with her parents. Laban hurries out and welcomes Jacob into the house. Over goat milk, Jacob tells his story. Jacob stays and helps Laban run his ranch. Thirty days go by with Jacob proving to be a big help. The guy was a good worker. Things got done around the tent that had been sitting like that for years. The honeydew list got shorter and shorter. Jacob had a good time around the household and falls in love with the vivacious Rachel. Laban notices and begins to scheme. Boy, was this a schemer. Every way he looks, he sees more green. Come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. Name your price, he says to Jacob, knowing what it would be likely be. Jacob says, I'll work seven years for your daughter, Rachel. Done, says the crafty Laban. Girls are getting older anyhow, and I can kill several birds with this stone. Life is good. 
I'll get seven years for one, and just maybe, <laughs> if I play this right, who knows? The seven years seem like just a few days to Jacob, hard work each day, a glimpse of the lovely Rachel, weary head down on the pillow, dreams in the night, ah, the good life of anticipation, a true love story. Time's up. The big day is here. A bargain is a bargain. Time for a wedding. Time for music and dance. Time for wine and song. Time for a big feast. Time to get this thing knotted up. Call all the neighbors and have them come. The lovely lady is presented all modestly veiled in the presence of all those leering guests. A short stroll to the tent in all is honeymoon bliss. Nothing could spoil this lovely ending to a seven-year romance. Or could there? What a terrible surprise in the light of the new day. You're not Rachel. You're Leah. A classic car lover was looking for a particular model of Studebaker. In the normal course of his scanning the newspaper, he saw an ad that seemed impossible to believe. Just the car he wanted was advertised, but for a mere $100. Knowing the car should have sold for thousands, he concluded that the car was either in a basket or there was a misprint. Finally, his curiosity got the best of him and he called. A woman answered the phone and assured him that the car was in excellent shape and that there was no mistake around the, about the price. With the scent of a bargain in the air, the car connoisseur hurried over to investigate. To his delight, the car proved to be everything the woman reported it to be. It was beautiful. Of course, he told her that he would take it for $100. Twinges of guilt finally became so strong that the man had to confess to the woman, Ma'am, I have to tell you that this car is worth far more than $100. You should get more than that for this automobile. Oh, I know that, she replied. But you see, my husband has left me to run off with his secretary. He sent me the title to the car and told me to sell it and send him the money. That's what I intend to do with the $100. Oh, the surprise. Oh, the remorse. Can you see some poetic justice here in this story with Jacob and Leah and Rachel? The deceiver is being deceived. He claimed he was the firstborn and ended up getting the, getting the firstborn when he dearly loved the secondborn. He deceived his blind father and got taken with a veiled young woman. We often think of Jacob and his situation and how he must have felt. Possibly we do. But what about the girls involved here? Did Laban make all this happen? What a pig. Did Leah really want to be a part of this? How did she disguise her voice in the night? What about Rachel? Where was she during the wedding celebration? Of course, there's the confrontation with Laban next morning. What is this that you have done to me, Jacob says. And in it, we hear the echoes of the past. Pharaoh to Abraham, what have you done to me? Surprise and outrage. Abimelech to Abraham. Abimelech to Isaac. Isaac to Jacob, what have you done? Here we have the deceiver being deceived, and the deceit has come full circle. Jacob's world becomes full. Four wives and heaps of trouble. Two sisters and their servant girls. Competition, jealousy, Blaming Jacob for the infertility. Schemes to get Jacob's affection and presence. Jacob working now to get some possessions of his own. The off-colored animals became his as part of a bargain he struck up with Laban. The scheming that went on. The ill will that developed with Laban and his sons. Time to get out of Dodge is rapidly approaching. And we will follow his departure from his uncle Laban for the land of Canaan in next week's class. I want to look at a few lessons perhaps from this passage. 
The first one is the consequence of sin. The consequence of sin that Jacob experienced. The first one is physical and emotional separation and loneliness. That is often a consequence of sin, is physical and emotional separation and loneliness. When there's sin, when there's strife in a family perhaps, there is that. We saw that the last time with Jacob. Jacob needed to leave his family and there was a long lonely travel that he made toward Haran. Secondly, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. We do reap what we sow. It's a law that is, um, you can't violate it. There is a law that happens. When we sin, we are going to reap for that sin. And we see that, of course, in the life of Jacob here. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. That's Galatians 6. Those who take up the sword will perish with the sword. Those who seek to deceive will be deceived. Those who sow to the flesh will reap corruption, the scripture says. Those who have compassion on others will find it in others. Those who stoop to serve others will find sympathy and help in time of trouble. Jacob tried to gain wealth for himself through deceit and ended up having to work so hard and long for it in the end. Had it not been for his deception of Isaac, he could have had all the dowry to take along from home back in Beersheba and could have come right back to his home in Canaan when he had his wife. But no, this is the reward, this is the consequence of sin. In spite of that, the grace of God is amazing. This is one of the central points that I'd like to make in this lesson today is the grace of God is amazing on our behalf. The grace of God continues to work in our lives even when we have experienced failures. God does not just kick us out. He does not just mete out punishment with a heavy hand. He disciplines us. It is His grace working in our lives for our good. God disciplines us for our good. We see that in this lesson today with Jacob. God was working in Jacob's life. Hebrews 12, verse 4 says this, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have had all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplines us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Jacob had learned some lessons that he need Jacob had some lessons that he needed to learn, lessons of life and love. It is great for us to learn lessons without requiring God's discipline, but often it is the only way we will learn. Jacob reminds me of someone who would need a lot of hitting on the head for things to sink in. He had a hard head. Some of us are like Jacob. First, Jacob learned to respect convention. 
the way things are done in our culture. We can't just do in things any old way and try to gain our ends. We can't cheat. The incident at the well shows that he didn't pay much attention to convention. The marrying of the younger sister, maybe even the way he greeted Rachel. Then there was the delay of 20 years in Haran. 20 years that Jacob spent in Haran. He, he went in there as a 70-something and came out of there as a 90-something-year-old man. For many, a time of delay is painful. I believe that Jacob particularly may have hated delay. God gave him delay as discipline, as training. He didn't need to get back to Canaan and the wrath of his brother any sooner. And for us, God sometimes delays things for our discipline and for our learning. He, he, he creates delay, and I, I often hate delay in my life. But God is there, and he puts that in my path. And he uses it as a form of discipline. And then there was the fact of having Leah for a wife. God did provide this. God did provide Leah for a wife for Jacob. Leah produced six of the 12 tribes that would come from Israel, which is what Jacob was called later. Judah, through whom Christ would come, is a son, was a son of Leah. Levi, who produced the priestly line, was one of her children. And Leah, in the end, was buried with Jacob at a good age, unlike Rachel. The next point I'd like to make is that guidance is important. Guidance in life is important. I'd like to contrast the choosing of Rebekah to that of Rachel. Isaac was under the advice and guidance and blessing of his father when Rebekah was chosen. The servant who went to find Rebekah bathed his adventure to find a wife with prayer. There was a lot of prayer and seeking God's face. Not here in this account with, with Rachel and Leah. It seemed like it was just you know, impetus, just, just impetuous decision making. Jacob seems to have chosen Rachel more on hormones than on the leading of God. Listen up, young people. He did, Jacob did not look at character necessarily. He did not counsel with others. He sought to overturn the customs of the day and make his own road through bargaining with Laban. Jacob was led by romanticism. My question to us is, how are we led when we make important decisions such as seeking a life partner, such as making li important life decisions of other types? Do we seek the Lord's face carefully and diligently? I recommend it wholeheartedly. Do we seek from counsel from those who are mature spiritually? We need to do that. Or do we just barge ahead and try to get what pleases us? Cardinal John Henry Newman shares the following quote, Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. Just one, one step is enough for me. F.B. Meyer shares the following. The circumstances of our daily life are to us an infallible indication of God's will when they concur with the inward promptings of the Spirit and with the Word of God. So long as they are stationary, wait. When, they, when you must act, they will open. And a way will, will be made through oceans and rivers, wastes and rocks. We must seek God's guidance for our lives on a daily basis. Not running ahead, not lagging behind. Trusting the engineer when our train goes through a dark tunnel. That sometimes is the hardest part. The next thing I'd like to talk about is beauty. The thing about beauty, we see that coming into focus in our lesson today. Rachel was beautiful, wonderfully endowed in a physical sense. She was, Bible says, beautiful in form and appearance. Lovely in form and beautiful. She was the one with fire in her eyes. 
She was capable and physically fit. She stood out in the crowd, a beautiful woman. Leah was more reserved. She had tender eyes, the Bible says. Maybe she tended to look down more, maybe more shy. Maybe she was not so outgoing. It seems that Jacob made his choice purely on what he saw as physical beauty. It was what was on the outside. He saw a lovely form. He saw a beautiful face. It is a mistake to judge on what is only on the outside and ignore the character of a person. That's a mistake. As we grow older, we can understand this more. Happy is a young person who can grasp this principle early in life. Henry David Thoreau says the perception of beauty is a moral test. Proverbs 31.30 Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. 1 Peter 3, verse 1, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornments, such as braided hair and wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Someone has said people are like stained glass windows. They sparkle and shine when the sun is out. But in the darkness beauty is seen only if there is a light within. Real beauty, then, is that of the heart. Ladies, that is where your efforts should be. Young men, when you look for true beauty in a lady friend, it is that of the heart. The outside is only skin deep and is not where our focus should be. Okay, I'd like to wrap up this study and have us identify with the characters in the study a bit and hopefully draw some lessons there. The first character I want to talk about is Laban. I hope you don't identify with Laban. His greed left him poorer by far. Things of this world and its wealth have a way of fading away and becoming unimportant in the big scheme of things. The second character is that of Jacob. You've tried so hard and just when you think you have gotten there, the, the rug gets pulled out from under you. You've made some bad choices. God will still work in your life. He has not given up on you. The grace of God is so outstanding, amazing grace. We all need to be thankful for the grace of God. He continues to work through the most difficult cases. And that is those of us who God is working in. The third one is Rachel. On the surface, you seem to have it all together. Others may envy your physical beauty and charm. It seems like you should be on top of the world, but inside you are lonely and are struggling spiritually. You need to seek to build that deep relationship with the Lord and to put Him first in your life. All good things come from Him, from God. Finally, there's Leah. The world is ignoring you because of your looks or your humble status, but you have a deep relationship with God. Don't despair. God looks at the heart. And a woman of deep faith and conviction will be used of God in his great plan. There are also some great guys out there who do recognize worth when they get to know you. Lessons in life and love. From the life of Jacob. I hope you've enjoyed this class and uh, the insight into learning the lessons of life and love. God bless.